good evening to, to everyone and welcome to this webinar on clinical trials, what they are and how are they conducted. Uh, my name is Alfonso Aguilon and I will be moderating today's session. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speakers today, Anastasia Nekuk, Head of the International Policy Department and Saskia Litiere, Head of the Statistics Department, both at the European Platform of Cancer Research, the OTC headquarters in Brussels, Belgium. So Anastasia and Saskia, on behalf of Line Cancer Europe, I would really like to thank you for your cooperation and your time today uh, to touch base on such an exciting topic as uh, clinical trials. So um, before we get started, uh, if this is the first time you are joining one of our webinars, I would like to give you a little briefing about the session. So it will mainly split into two parts. During the first part, our speakers today will make a presentation on the topic, which will last around 40 minutes. And then we will open a round of questions from, from the audience and you will be able to ask yours. There are mainly two ways in which you can, you can make your questions. The first one, you can just press the raise hand icon that you will find in the GoToWebinar application. You just download it to, to join the session. And I'll need your microphone when it is your time so you will be able to make your question live. In case you prefer to send your question by writing, you can type it, uh, you can type it in the chat window. So I'll uh, copy and read them at the end uh, of the session. So without further ado, I wish you all a very fruitful webinar. And uh, Anastasia, the floor is yours. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to present you today uh, how are clinical trials organized and the practical setup legal and ethical framework. So um, first I'll explain you how clinical trials are organized in the nutshell. So first of all, there is of course a research question or questions that researchers ask themselves. So based on that, researchers will write the clinical trial protocol where among other chapters and among other elements, you would also find a full description of the statistics of this protocol. And actually you will learn a little bit more about uh, that part uh, later on today. Um, thereafter, once you have a good ideas and you have a good protocol, you need to um, select your sites and investigators. So of course, clinical trials are about patients. But the clinical trial sponsor, whether it's a URTC, a non-for-profit organization, where it's a pharmaceutical company, cannot go uh, directly to patients. So our way to patients is through sites and through investigators. And so one of the challenges of a successful clinical trial is to understand where patients with specific diseases are actually treated. And um, for uh, cancer clinical trials, it might be somehow a little bit easier, specifically for more complicated cancers. Patients will probably go to key cancer centers, which are easy to identify. But more and more uh, cancers, specifically uh, in early stages, are treated in local hospitals. And some conditions may even be treated, for instance, in elderly, in, in um, elderly homes. So it's not always easy to get access to those patients. And for a success of a clinical trial, we need to understand that we do have access to enough patients to be able to complete the project. So once we understand that we do have the right number of sites and investigators that will enable us to access to the patients, uh, we need to get this clinical trial protocol through all the number of authorizations and legal approvals. So we're speaking about research which involves human beings, so you cannot just improvise it and do it without authorizations. And later in my presentation, I will touch a little bit to what kind of authorizations and approvals you need to be able to start the protocol. But of course, um, clinical trial protocol is never done just by one organization. So you have already a collaboration with sites. You also frequently have other partners involved in clinical trials. Uh, when you speak about clinical trials on rare cancers, many different organizations need to join forces to run a global trial, and that further increase the number of partners. 
So basically you need uh, in parallel of um, developing your project to sign contracts, to document all this partnership and contracts, to set up all your logistics, the drug supply, the sample shipment, etc., and also design the case report forms. So those are forms or to design your database. So the way to capture the information from the clinical trials so that you have the reliable data to be analyzed. Once this is done, you can start selecting patients and start treating them if it's a treatment protocol as you described in your protocol. And of course, you collect your data, you check your data are accurate, and you validate the data in this way. And that also can involve uh, on site source data verification. So, in parallel to those bits, there is an ongoing medical and safety monitoring because you need to review cases to ensure that patients are safe and that eventually you would in time upgrade the monitoring procedures. You continue with the drug and sample management and shipment and of course you put in place the quality insurance which again will um, make sure that your data are as correct and as robust as possible. Once all your patients are recruited and all data are collected and quality checked, you can start doing the statistical analysis. Once this analysis is done, of course, you can go and publish those results. And once the results are published, the, what you, we actually all hope for, that those results will change the clinical practice or eventually in the case of trials run by pharmaceutical industry that uh, there will be a drug registration or label extension. So this is in a nutshell uh, kind of what is the, the cycle of a clinical trial. So what about the return of results to patients? So of course the global trial results uh, need to be reported to patients. And for clinical trials run in Europe, the summary of results is publicly available. And on the slides, you have the link to the database you can search. So for all interventional research run with drugs in Europe, you can um, search this database. And if the trial is finished and the results are available, they will be uploaded in a certain format uh, in this register. But this is covering only clinical trials, so uh, interventional prospective experiments with drugs. We do not have a global EU clinical research registry. So studies on surgery or on radiotherapy um, or retrospective research projects which will use already collected data or already collected samples to gain further knowledge, we don't have an EU registry for that. So there is uh, a US registry called clinicaltrials.gov that you can consult also, uh, which is larger than just clinical trials, but not all European organizations report uh, their research in there because simply this is voluntary on the voluntary basis and not mandatory. The lay summary of results, uh, which would be much more useful for you because uh, it's easier to understand, is mandatory soon. Um, it's coming in the scope of the new clinical trial regulation, which shall be applicable within one or two years from now. And uh, the lay summaries will be available through the same uh, European register that I already referred to. But of course, we are also interested to know what about the return to patients of their individual results. So many tests are done in the scope of clinical trials. Some tests are done locally, so they are part of the uh, patient medical file at the hospital, but some of the tests and calculations are done centrally, so outside of the hospital. And so even the doctors can uh, eventually not be directly in the possession of those results. So uh, when we speak about the return to patients of individual results, we need to pay attention on which results, what results we are speaking about. So uh, in terms of what UTC does, we are feeding back to patients clinically relevant results. 
So why only clinical relevant? Uh, what if those results are not clinically relevant and actually what it means? Well, um, imagine that um, nowadays we have a lot of sequencing in many projects and uh, sequencing will see that there is a mutation. But uh, given the current level of knowledge, we don't always know. Um, what does it mean that there is a mutation? For some mutations, we don't even know if it's just a diversity or if it's really an abnormality. So basically, uh, it's like seeing all these different colors and not understanding at all what does it mean clinically if you have a red color or a yellow color. So actually, it's not meaningful. This is why we do uh, report clinically relevant results or where we do understand what it actually means for the health of patients. Actionable, what does it mean actionable? So some of the clinically relevant results, for instance, we know that this mutation corresponds to something we can describe, but there is nothing to be done around. For instance, there is no specific treatment and no specific uh, uh, medication or procedure that can help you to prevent something or to correct something. So basically, um, if we uh, return automatically to patients all results, including those which are not actionable, so actually you will be asking the question to your doctor, so you think you can do nothing, which is which is very frustrating, and I guess not all patients uh, wish to know something where they can uh, not do anything about it, and doctors neither. So validated. And so what it means if um, tests are not validated? So every test has a certain probability of being right. For instance, even when um, you do a simple blood count in your blood, so you receive the result which says you have that many red blood cells per volume of blood. Uh, the test that is doing it have a certain probability of being right and of being wrong. So of course, tests such as blood counts are very nicely validated these days, they're very precise. So you're pretty sure that the number you see is a realistic number. But tests which are still experimental are under validation. Uh, you, you actually don't even know your probability and sometimes the probability can be very low that the test is accurate. So basically giving the results of non-validated tests is the same as saying to you, well, uh, I see this result, maybe it's true, but maybe not, and it's like 50-50. And for some of the types of results, that's, that can be extremely stressful. So if, if it's about uh, something like uh, um, BRC2, BRC1, Jensen cancer and breast cancer, you don't want to hear there may be a possibility you have such a frightening something, but at the same time, maybe there is equal number of chances that actually you don't have it. So that's why uh, prospectively we do feedback to the investigators who feedback these two patients, the clinically relevant, actionable and validated results. Um, so being said so, uh, all of those, whether they are cl clinically relevant or not, actionable or not, validated or not, uh, those results are your personal data. So actually you can request access to all those, but that would be usually iPhone request and you can use the um, very recent uh, GDPR to request the access to your data if you want to have them all. So now I'll uh, summarize briefly the ethical and the legal framework applicable to clinical trials. So research involving humans is um, legislated uh, in a very complicated way. You find guidelines and legislation on international level, you find another set of documents on the EU level, uh, more on the national level, and in some countries even on a local level. So the legal framework is extremely complex, 
And I must say uh, for um, any uh, clinical trial runner and specifically for academic organizations, a real challenge to keep up to date and to understand and know all updates to all these legislations. So uh, looking on the international guidelines and focusing on ethics, I'll give a very brief overview of different documents that constitute the current ethical framework. So it all started, if we take it historically, with awful experiences of the Second World War. And uh, in reaction to that, uh, the, the first kind of cornerstone of the modern ethics would be the Nuremberg Code that was uh, issued by the US military court in 1947. Uh, followed the Declaration of Geneva. Um, and then, um, of course, um, Sorry, I have some, some problems with my screen. Oops. And then, of course, the Universal Declaration of the Human Rights. Uh, and then the Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. So those documents, though their titles are somehow similar, there has been issued by different entities in different geographical regions. Uh, and despite all these guidances uh, and documents, uh, of course, that didn't um, prevent it an awful uh, incident from happening. And many of you heard about the Talidomid case. Uh, declaration of Helsinki appeared lately, shortly. But again, that didn't prevent it another awful incident from happening. The ICHGCP uh, occurred, uh, has been kind of issued the first time in 96 to harmonize the way the drugs are registered between different regions in the world. Uh, Oviedo Convention and its additional protocols, which currently constitute a, a very solid basis for the work of ethical committees in Europe. The WHO and Science guidances, which are also ethical guidances. Again, it didn't prevent it, another incident from happening. Declaration of Helsinki has been updated. And again, we see some unfortunate cases. So I think the main message of that is that uh, the piling up of regulation doesn't necessarily prevent incidents, very unfortunate incidents from happening time to time, but it actually makes the life of those responsible for running clinical trials much more difficult to be sure that they comply with all of those. And within Europe, uh, so if you want to learn more about the ethical framework, specifically in Europe, so you have a resource here, it's an e-learning, uh, it's for free. It's a very good resource to learn and even to get certificates in ethics with different levels. So you can follow kind of introductory module one, but you can go deeper and deeper in your knowledge. And of course, the guarantees of the respect of the ethical framework are ethical committees in Europe. Um, it's called for US institutional review boards. And so their work is very important. So more about ethical committees. Uh, ethical committees ensure that medical experiment, experimentation and human research are carried out in the ethical manner. That's their primary purpose. Uh, ethics is a national competence, so every country in Europe will uh, set up its ethical committees uh, in its own way. It's somehow similar, but at the same time, uh, different ethical committees are composed and are functioning in a slightly different way. Um, their composition is similar, they are multidisciplinary and they include laypersons. But for instance, what is considered lay differs sensibly from one country to another. In some countries, you would find patient representatives to kind of represent the lay person. In some countries, a lay person can be a lawyer, and in some countries, it can be even a priest. So there are two main systems in, 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 in the way the ethical committees are functioning. Uh, the centralized system, where one ethical committee will judge on one clinical trial and collegial or, or local, uh, where many ethical committees in the same country will review the same trial and will need to arrive to somehow consistent decision about this trial. 
So the examples of this can be Portugal, where you really have a truly centralized ethical committee, it's one for the whole country. But France has a very good system as well. In France, you have several ethical committees, but only one ethical committee will actually review one trial. And then the next trial can be reviewed by another ethical committee to share work. Uh, this uh, system, the one that we see in France, is, is much better for the eventual appeals than a truly centralized one. And the collegial uh, or local uh, systems, well, Belgium is an example, Italy is another example. So the clinical trials uh, has to be submitted to multiple ethical committees uh, and they arrive to somehow a consensus, but this is usually quite tremendous uh, and there are a lot of discussions and time spent in that. So biomedical research in Europe is regulated by different bodies. And I think it's important to understand specifically if you do want to um, impact the way the research is conducted in Europe. So if you try to plead your cause and you are speaking to the wrong entity, that it's not in the scope of their activities, then you miss your target. So the biomedical research is regulated by the Council of Europe and by the European Union. So if, if you don't know pretty much uh, how, how Europe is functioning, so the Council of Europe has nothing to do with the European Union. It's 47 member states. So the Council of Europe are um, basically for, for this purpose represented by health ministers of those different countries. It's quite a geographical Europe. And the European Union, well, 28 with Brexit, 27 European Union member states. So the Council of Europe will issue documents such as Biomedicine Convention, Additional Protocol on Biomedical Research, Recommendations on Research on Biological Materials. So all these documents that will largely guide the ethical committees. And European Union will uh, issue EU regulations, directives, and the guidelines. And the focus of these bodies is different. So the national laws and guidelines need to somehow accommodate all of them uh, when the Council of Europe is focusing on ethics and human rights and where the European Union is focusing on product safety and competitiveness. So if we really take the EU clinical research framework, so not when we only speak exclusively about trials which are there to register new medicine, but as I was mentioning previously, trials can be run also to improve surgical procedures, to improve radiotherapy, simply to learn more about patient reported outcomes or to find more about uh, just how, how patients experience the treatment and uh, how tumor evolves throughout different stages of the disease. So aside the international guidances that I already mentioned, you have the European framework where you have different legislations that will apply. You have the clinical trial directive, you have the data protection directive, you have ionizing radiation and safety, legislations which impact on the way the radiotherapy trials will be conducted. You have medical device and vitro diagnostics regulations. So that gives a very complex environment, specifically that some of this legislation need to be further transposed into the national legislation. And that's where on the level of each country you find laws on human research, other set of laws about the drug laws and clinical trials, laws on biobanking, on radio protection, on data protection, on genetic testing, on GMOs. And so it's, it's, it's layers and layers and layers. And uh, sometimes also there are additional international professional codes. So despite the fact that the ERTC believes that it's important to have uh, a wise regulations that rule uh, on the way how the human research shall be conducted, because it's important it's conducted in a responsible and correct way. But the current multi-layered EU health regulations uh, need coordination and convergence. And so we, we are trying to plead uh, for that and, and we publish on that regularly. So in, in order to have a good and balanced legislation, of course, you need to balance key considerations 
privacy is important, but somehow there is a conflict between privacy and transparency. So many patients pleaded to have more results of clinical trials being publicly available. But some of these results uh, may probably be not fully anonymized, like genetic results. They, they're hard to make fully anonymized and confidential. So there will be a tension between the wish of transparency and data sharing and the protection of personal data of patients and patients' rights in general. There is um, a tension between the patient rights, for instance, the right to have their data, and commercial confidentiality and unfair competition because uh, some of um, third country uh, companies can be very aggressive and going on uh, up to paying patients to basically indirectly provide them with the data from their competitors. So it's not just a science fiction, it, it has been happening. Uh, and there is also a tension between the commercial confidentiality and transparency because, of course, we would like to have more transparency, but uh, the commercial entities would try to cover them up by the confidentiality to limit the transparency. And it's not black or white, it's all delicate balances and probably almost a case-by-case -case evaluation. So lessons that we can learn from, from the last uh, experiences of, of uh, legislation development is that guidelines and legislation are essential to protect participants, but they need to avoid unnecessary administration and uh, somehow they need to be cost effective. Because again, with the example of transparency, transparency is very important, but if the, um, the work needed to ensure transparency increase the cost of the trial beyond reasonable, that needs to be monitored as well. So as with every additional step, there is a need to uh, achieve a balance between the, um, what you take out of it from, from what you input in it. So clinical trials require scientific knowledge, of course, and that's what most of people are thinking about at first. But nowadays, it's, it's a very complex adventure and it also requires a very specialized operational knowledge and legal expertise. And if you jump into a clinical trial not being prepared on the operational and legal side, then you will be starting a little bit like this nice ducky with a lot of chicken where most of them will be lost in the middle of the way. And so coming back to the clinical trial terminology, you would not have um, a solid and reliable results. And so that again will just waste the effort and sacrifices of the patient that has been involved. And I think that was my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much, Anastasia. So I think uh, uh, Saskia will make you the presenter now, if that's okay. So, So you should be able to see my screen. I'll, yeah. I'll just put it full screen and then try to make sure you only see it once. Is it okay, Alfonso? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. Yeah, I'm ready to go now. The floor is yours. Okay. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, after this very nice introduction on how to do clinical trials practically, we thought it might also be nice to tell you a little bit more about how we do clinical trials scientifically. And um, since I only have about 15 to 20 minutes or so to leave you some room for questions, uh, I'll try to give you a very general overview of the types of clinical research we do without going into too many details, but just showing you like how you can do it and what are the advantages and disadvantages of each of these approaches. So let's say we have a question, we have a treatment wonder pill, and we want to know uh, uh, how a particular patient will respond to these treatments. So the first place to look would be to ask the experts in the field. So 
uh, maybe maybe the expert already has some some experience uh, with the new treatment. So with Wonder Pill, maybe not in this particular uh, disease setting, but maybe in other in another type of disease, or maybe the expert has. Uh, some experience with a treatment that has a similar mode of action and then based on his experience based on his beliefs and intuition you may come up with an answer like I think the patient will respond this and this or this will work this and this way for this particular uh, new scenario so this can help a lot this type of logic reasoning can help a lot to to develop new paths of research however we have to be careful um, because, for instance, and it's an old example, but it still remains uh, a valid uh, case against trusting too much our, our, our intuition. So in the 1980s, uh, the medical community knew that antiarrhythmic therapy reduced abnormal heart rhythm. They also knew at that time that patients who experienced a heart attack were very likely to develop abnormal uh, heart rhythm. So intuitively it would make sense to give to patients who developed a heart attack to give them antiarrhythmic therapy with the aim like that to avoid or to reduce the chance for these patients to develop an abnormal heart rhythm intuitively it makes sense in practice it was shown in 1989 with a randomized trial that it's actually increased the mortality in patients who experienced a heart attack so we have to be careful because sometimes our intuition can be wrong so how do we how do we know if the wonder pill would work for our particular patient? Well, the easiest way to do it would be just to give the treatment to the patient. This gives some useful information on um, uh, sorry because this is covering part of my screen uh, uh, some useful information on symptoms and response uh, to treatment of that particular patient if you're dealing with a setting where it's a very rare disease it may actually be the only information you may have is just by trying it out if you have a, a decent a decent logic to to try it out but as you as you well know each patient is unique so if you just try it out in one patient is what you're seeing the symptoms and the response to treatment is that normal or is your patient maybe a little bit unusual so can we translate what we see in our one particular patient also to other patients with the same condition so the only way to figure out that would be to consider a series of patients for instance let's say uh, we look at all patients with a non-small cell lung cancer who are treated with Wonder Pill in the last two years in Saint Luc. Saint Luc is a hospital that is just uh, next door uh, from the office, the offices where I'm working right now. So you could have a look there. You could collect the information. Uh, this is what we call a retrospective series because we're going back in time and we're collecting data that is already available and we can collect this data either from hospital records so we can start to contact uh, clinicians for instance and ask them to provide us with some some summary data on their patients we can go to registries that also have retrospective data or we can extract this information that we need from existing trial databases the advantage of this is that the information is already available, so there is no loss to follow up, which means, for instance, that if you need 100 patients to come to a conclusion, then you can actually look for information until you have 100 patients. And so this is quite quick to complete. It can be very important when you're dealing with a rare disease, so if you can collect information from different sources, uh, it can be very uh, useful to document what happens in these settings. Logistically, it's quite easy. So you just collect the data and also um, pragmatically from a cost perspective, it's also not very expensive. The downside of this is that, well, it's, you're, you really depend on the information that is out there. If you are interested, and that's, for instance, a limitation with some of the registries, uh, if you if you are interested to see how patients with a certain mutation are uh, responding to classical standard of treatment because the new drug is targeting that particular mutation, then if that mutation has never been collected in your patient population uh, or in the in the historical data, then you have a problem because you won't have the data. There's also the time effect that can be of, of, of play. Sometimes you can go back 20, 30 years in time and find patients, but 
is their outcome or is the, 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 the evolution of their disease still uh, uh, reflective of how patients would evolve today because um, standard of care may have changed, supportive care may have changed, uh, the staging of disease may have changed. So is this still is this still reflective or is this really uh, still accurately reflecting what is, is the, 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 the information for today? It may also be very selected. Let's say you go to a hospital and you get all the information from patients who were treated by uh, only one uh, surgeon, for instance. Can we extract or can we can we extrapolate it, what we learn from this data to all surgeons? Or on the other hand, if the data are very heterogeneous because we have different sources of data, uh, for instance, different hospitals, or we're merging registries with hospitals or with other types of data, we don't necessarily have a control over how the treatment was given. So everybody follows their own standard practice. The, they decide on, on, on based on their own standard practice on, on when to continue or stop a treatment or reduce a treatment. And we also don't have any control on how the outcome was assessed, how frequently it was assessed. And so, yeah, last but not least, it's only is applicable if it's for treatments that are already being given in practice. I mean, if, the, if it's not already being used in practice, then this approach will not really help us. So alternatively, we could look at all patients with a non-small cell lung cancer who will be treated with Wonder, Wonder Pill in the next two years. Then we're talking about a prospective uh, series of, of, of patients and a prospective data collection. It can be organized as a registry, like uh, reflecting the standard uh, practice, or it can also be organized in the context of a clinical trial where the intervention, so in this case, Wonderfill, Wonderpill is pre-specified. It's explained how you're giving the treatment, at which uh, doses, how you handle side effects that make it difficult to tolerate the treatment, and when you decide, for instance, on how to, yeah, ongoing of the treatment. So the advantage of such an approach is that you have a lot of control on the information that is being collected. You can decide which patients will receive the treatment, how they will receive the treatment, how frequently they will be followed, and on all the parameters that you are interested in to collect that will help you in your analysis. So this is a very focused, very targeted type of research. But it also means you have to wait for at least two years to find the patients, plus you need to wait for the information, the follow-up information to become available that will tell you whether the treatment uh, is actually doing something. Also, as explained by uh, Anastasia in the previous presentation, this can require approval from regulatory offices and also ethical committee approval. So this can require quite some administrative uh, work. It becomes a bit more expensive because once you're asking patients to, to, to receive a certain treatment for your research, you'll likely be asked to either provide the treatment or pay for the cost of the treatment, as well as for any assessments that will be done that may be outside of, of, of standard practice. And then logistically, it also becomes more demanding because suddenly you need to have a central system for data collection that everybody needs to be able to access. Uh, you, you may need to organize shipments of biological materials. For instance, you may want to do some, some tests on, on, on tumor material that is extracted from a biopsy or, or from, from surgery, or you may want to do some tests on blood samples. So these tests, these, this, this material needs to be shipped to a laboratory where you can do the tests. And so it all becomes slightly a bit more complex, a bit more time consuming and a bit more ex expensive. And in the end, it doesn't really tell you how your wonder pill compares to what is currently available or considered the standard of care. So I've denoted here by standardism, so showing that it could be a treatment, but it could also be uh, best supportive care. It could be nothing, just wait and see, or it could be uh, another treatment as well. So how could you how could you put this in perspective of uh, a control treatments? Uh, well, one approach you could take is to consider a historical control. So standard design is very well documented for the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer patients. So you can go back to the publications, you can go back to the reports and get some information on how the patients that are being treated with this treatment are doing in terms of response. Or if you're lucky, you may be able to access certain databases. So historical arms, huh? like we've mentioned before, retrospective series, 
uh, that can help you to, to answer the question to see how WonderPill matches to standardizing. The advantage of this approach is that at least the information from the historical control is available in one format or another. It does not require any additional patient commitment, so you don't need to add patients to the study that receive uh, that receive other types of treatments. And maybe if you are in a setting where the, the control arm or the standard of care is considered to have very little effect and maybe be very toxic, it might be even ethical to, to, to follow such an approach to avoid that you're exposing more patients to something that may uh, not work or may have some very bad side effects. However, the same considerations that we had before with the, the retrospective series apply. I mean, you still want to make sure that the historical control is applicable. So is it still timely? Is it really the same population? Does the population have the same characteristics? Was the same staging system used? I mean, staging systems, they are updated on a quite regular basis. So is a, a certain, I don't know, stage two patient from, from 10, 15, 20 years ago, the same stage two patient you would see today. And then also are the same imaging or diagnostic tools used for assessing the outcome. So it has some pros and some cons. So what you could do if you have access to individual patient data is you could try to do a matched control group. So you would say, I match each patient to a control patient with similar demographic and or disease characteristics. So that's so hoping that uh, at least if you see a, a difference between the group of patients that are treated with wonder pill and the group of patients that are treated with standard sin, for instance, an in overall survival, you can attribute it to the treatment. Now, the tricky thing about this is, and let's take a hypothetical example, Let's say by chance all the patients that received Wonder Pill are young patients, young, very healthy patients. Uh, well, okay, that's a contradiction in word, but young patients. Um, and maybe those patients who receive the standard is in by chance are more uh, the elderly patients. How do you know that the overall survival difference you see in between the two treatment groups? Uh, can be attributed to the treatment and is not just an effect of age, right? So that's the tricky, the, the tricky part of this type of approach. So ideally, yes, it can be done retrospectively. You can even do a prospective collection uh, or a prospective study where patients are receiving the standard treatment and you collect the information and you can match them. You can try to match them as good as possible so that the differences of the outcomes between the two groups cannot be attributed to something like as obvious as age. The only problem is that in the end, you do not really control who gets which treatment and not all the confounding factors are as obvious as age. So it, there may be something at play that you have not recorded. And so once it's not recorded, it's very difficult to account for it in the analysis. So that's where we move to the randomized clinical trial, because then you're actually randomizing patients to receive either one of the two treatments. So it goes randomly. You don't know up front who's going to receive what. Voila. And so basically you create two groups that uh, are comparable both in terms of known and unknown prognostic factors. So you can, you can optimize the process a little bit if you already know that age is an important factor. You can already try to make sure that at least age is very well balanced. But the randomization process, if the trial is big enough, also guarantees that uh, your, your two treatment arms are comparable uh, for unknown prognostic factors. And then you are sure that the only difference between the two arms is really the treatment. So if you see a difference, for instance, in terms of overall survival, you can attribute it to the, 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 the treatments. If there should be any time effect that happens in the duration of your trial, because sometimes uh, it takes a long time to recruit patients into studies, it may take up to five years, six years. If there are things happening that may have a time effect on your study, at least it will be balanced across the two arms. And then, of course, it has all the other advantages of pros prospective uh, research. The downside being also here that it has all the other disadvantages of prospective research, meaning it can become quite expensive. Uh, it can be time consuming because you may need to wait for a few years to get the outcome of the, of the study. 
there's all the regulation involved that you need to monitor, all the, the patient privacy, the data privacy you need to account for, and then all the logistics need to be put in place. So here is sort of like an overview, a summary of the types of, of, of uh, research I have shown to you. So building on top one on top of the other. And so the ordering in which I have shown this is not entirely random because the higher you go into this, the higher you go into this pyramid, so the, the higher the quality of evidence. And that's why this is called the evidence-based, uh, the pyramid of evidence-based medicine. So the higher you go, the, the stronger the, and more convincing the, the, the evidence is. But something you need to keep in mind, as for instance, an individual patient who is looking for an answer to a question like, what treatment should I use? And, and will this work for me? What we do when we do uh, this type of clinical research is we're trying to get summary statistics basically so we're trying to see on average the treatment is working or the treatment is not working well for patients having said that it doesn't necessarily answer the question whether a particular treatment will work for a specific patient and this was experienced firsthand by um, paul kalaniti who was a neurosurgeon uh, who was diagnosed with uh, lung cancer and uh, uh, accounted for his story of how he, he became from, from, from a doctor, he became a patient in, in his book, When Breath Becomes Air, where he mentioned that, yeah, you see all these curves, but the problem is you can't tell an individual patient where he or she is on this curve. So this, all of this clinical research can give, can give a physician guidance, but in the end, he still needs to take a decision whether to actually give a patient a particular treatment or not. So this is really, in a nutshell, a little bit uh, how we do clinical research. Um, if you want to know a bit more about, uh, about doing clinical research on cancer or more generally, these are two books that I can recommend um, heartily. Uh, so for instance, The Emperor of All Maladies, if you haven't read it, it's called, it's a biography of cancer and it actually gives a histor history of, of uh, cancer, how it was in the in the old Egyptian times, up to how um, it evolved over time, and also how the clinical research evolved uh, on looking for treatments for cancer. And it's a very it's a very accessible book. It's a it's a very nice book to read. It, it reads very well, and I highly recommend it to everybody, even if you don't have uh, a specific scientific background. It's really it's it's really accessible. And there's also the book of uh, Ben Goldacre on bad science, which gives an, an, an informative overview of how to do good clinical research by showing examples of how not to do it. And it also gives a bit of general medical context. Um, we also have here a link to our EURTC Patient Days video. So we had uh, a, this, this conference earlier this year before everything shut down due to the COVID crisis. So some of these presentations have been recorded and they are available through this link. And of course, there's also the European Patients Academy website where you can find a lot more information on uh, the practical aspects uh, of like the, 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 the scientific, the statistical aspects of doing clinical research. So with this, I think we should open the floor for uh, some questions. So I give back the microphone to you, Alfonso. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, Saskia. Thank you very much, Anastasia. Well, I think this very clear and comprehensive uh, presentation, which I think it was quite challenging because, you know, you can spend hours and hours uh, speaking about um, clinical trials, about clinical research, and about all the implications that they all have. So um, I would like to remind our audience the two ways in which you can make your questions. I have already received uh, some, some questions by writing, but just in case you would like to make your questions live, don't be shy. You can just press the raise hand button. I will unmute your microphone and, uh, and you can make your, your questions by voice or just send your questions in writing as some of you have, have already um, done. Uh, so we have 10 minutes for questions and I would like to start, it was not the first one I received, but it was probably my mistake when I started the, the presentation uh, because I mentioned your affiliation, but one person is asking what is the role of the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer, EOTC, which is the organization you 
you work for. So you could uh, explain us, uh, whoever you prefer, Anastasia or Saskia, what is the role of the ERTC? What's your Ask work? <laughs> Uh, yeah. I think you so, can you can yeah so uh, ERTC is um, an international non-for-profit organization and we actually run clinical trials we run clinical trials not to register drugs because we are not a pharmaceutical industry we don't manufacture products we don't produce devices so cancer is a multi-modality disease and a lot of progress can be achieved through optimization of treatment and this is the work we do most of the time so we design clinical trial which aim to optimize the care. Of course, time to time we work in partnership with the pharmaceutical industry because they can give us access to certain drugs uh, to test them, for instance, in a rare cancer or in a slightly different design. So when we work with the pharmaceutical industry, we always respect independency criteria. So uh, when we, we, we come with the idea, uh, there is an independent review of the concept and of the protocol. Uh, we manage the data, so th if they have access to the data, it's only uh, at the end of the research. And we make the first publication, so the, the, the research is done independently, as independently as possible. And we also like to control the biological material so that industry cannot prevent us to do more research on it. So that, that's what we are. And we have members in all different European countries. Uh, they are doctors and hospitals, and we run different clinical trials, not only in lung cancer, but including many other different types of cancer. So Saski, if you want to add anything. No, I think that's uh, that's pretty much it. Maybe just to add that our, our general director is also uh, actively talking a lot to the, to the European uh, representatives trying to, to streamline a little bit research, but I think you know more about that than, than I do. Don't know if you'd want to mention that. Yes, and also the fact that we develop methodologies, and yeah. this is more your aspect. So the way, <laughs> yeah, the way, the way doctors actually will evaluate the disease um, that can be used in a reliable yeah. way in, in the clinical trials. Great, thanks for for your answer. And uh, regarding this this uh, this answer, and th there is a question which probably relates, uh, uh, which comes from one of our uh, attendees, which says that every time there is a growing evidence about the value of patient involvement in clinical research, provided insight about exclusion and inclusion criteria, patient reported outcomes, protocols, quality of life. But it, he says that, however, the involvement is still very limited. So what is your opinion about the band barriers uh, to get a more effective involvement of, of patients and patient organizations in clinical research? Yeah, so um, we have quite some history of patient involvement and we, we uh, all our concepts are reviewed by patients and patient information sheets. And we have a patient panel that, that, that started recently and advised us on all many elements. So the main barriers are where to find patients. Uh, it's really difficult to find patients who are uh, able to invest enough time in this type of involvement uh, in, in a way which is um, uh, diversified. So we, we, we have a lot of experts that work with us and most of them are from Belgium, Netherlands, uh, UK and France, majority are from UK. It's very difficult to find patient representatives from Southern and Eastern Europe. Um, and as more uh, clinical trial runners or researchers want to involve patients, more challenging it will become. Because already now, when we contact certain of experts we know, they tell us they're too busy to accept new roles and new missions. So, so the, the, the selection and where to find those people and, and how to maintain their training and which level of training for which, so this is a barrier. So the sustainability is a barrier because it's not because you found them once that that will last forever. Some patients, unfortunately, will, you know, recure, their, their illness will come back. Some others will just go to something else in their life. They will just do it for some time being and, and then will pass to something else. So actually the selection and this maintenance and training is, is a permanent process, uh, sustainability. And then um, 
uh, also the sustainability in terms of um, how to compensate patients. So uh, industry has a lot of discussions about a kind of fair compensation, we are speaking money, but for the academic researchers, th this is barely feasible. We already don't have enough money to run research. So like, what are the means to basically say thank you to people having investing their time? This is also, uh, and that, that kind of um, joins uh, the, the sustainability barrier, it's a part of it. And, and the last one is the scalability. So that again goes to the capacity to put timelines, capacity to build process. We are very, uh, like clinical research is a very regulated field and very, uh, very fine and inspected field. So if we say that all our concepts are reviewed by patient representatives, we put it in our procedure and it needs to happen 100% of time. And if it's not happening once because we're in Saba and the experts went on holiday, we need to have a plan B. So this scalability, so to, to from um, ad hoc involvement for key projects to put it in place, all activities, that's a challenge. And so the one needs to go uh, step by step and frankly, sometimes doctors just don't know how to approach patients. They know how to speak to their patients. They don't know how to involve patients in research. Hopefully we, we will get there smoothly uh, and increasingly uh, in the future, but that, that was a good, that was a good uh, explanation, uh, Anastasia. Okay, next question is about uh, investigator initiated studies. One of our, uh, attendees mentioned that he, she has heard about the investigator initiated studies in the past and she asked whether do they differ a lot from other types of studies or trials and what are their pros and cons? So, so in, investigator initiated trials are basically the same as they follow the same rules as um, as all the research, so they have to follow all the legislation. They have to follow all the rules of, 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 of uh, yeah, the, the 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 rules of the game. So in that sense, there should not be a difference between uh, investigator-initiated trials and and, for instance, fully company-sponsored trials. The only difference that you might have is, of course, the level of money that is involved. So, uh, but apart from that, at least from my perspective. Uh, I think there shouldn't be a difference. And, uh, yeah, and the trials the OTC does technically they are investigate initiated trials yes. because usually investigate initiated trials is described in a position to the industry driven trials. And so insofar we are not an industry and all our trials are designed by investigators. Um, the their investigator driven trials. So within the different investigator driven trials, there are also trials that will be conducted just by one university. And then there are trials which will be conducted by networks. We are not the only network existing. There are many different academic networks in France. Uh, Unicancer is very well known. Uh, uh, there are basically many different groups uh, acting in different countries. And I would say what the patient probably shall pay attention to is um, the, what is the potential uh, impact of this trial. So there are some studies that are done on the level of individual hospital which are very relevant, where uh, the number of patients will drive this trial to very varied results. Usually those are early and exploratory trials. When you start running large phase three trials, so where you need a lot of patients to prove something, um, where you are touching to a, a rare subtype of cancer, right? The, the probability that an individual site will have the capacity and the numbers to run uh, um, a research that will be a game changer is smaller. And then you would rather go within the different, um, different types of investigator driven trial, probably to a trial run by a larger network, simply because it will probably make a bigger impact. So that, that's the only kind of difference for me. There are, there are different types of investigator driven trials, mm -hmm. but as such in terms of their uh, regulations applicable or, or 
else there is not specifically any difference, at least from the perspective of the law and ethics. Thanks a lot for your answer. We still have a couple of questions. We are about to run out of time. I don't know whether Saskia and Anastasia, you have any issue if we go with these two questions before we end with the webinar? Is that okay? okay, great. So one of them, I think it, 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 it's quite interesting because it's, it's uh, basically covering the current situation. So the question is, uh, given the current COVID-19 outbreak, we have seen how processes when it comes to clinical trial have become more agile and fast. And the question is, do you think this is going to be uh, a stand alone for the current situation or may this change the way trials will be run from now on? Um, oh. <laughs> I think we found a lot of interesting elements where uh, certain barriers and certain heaviness of procedures can be alleviated in a way that doesn't put patients in danger. However, and ERTC was uh, very closely uh, collaborating with uh, different stakeholders and commission and EMA uh, for different exceptions that were made in the scope of the guidances for the conduct of the clinical trials and all different uh, deviations and changes that can be put in place. And they're all saying, once the crisis is over, uh, these specific arrangements are over as well. So, yes, for sure, all stakeholders will, um, you know, uh, summarize the lessons learned and they will uh, try thereafter to go to the authorities saying if it worked in the crisis uh, and, and, and if we don't see any reason not to continue it, let's just continue it. But that will require some work because all different guidances that they made uh, a priori are supposed to be um, over uh, when the crisis is officially over. And there, I must say, if patient organizations saw some elements which they find interesting and practical and useful, it would be extremely interesting that they voice it out to stakeholders and to politicians, to both. Because I, I personally would be uh, quite interested to learn what patients found as a good kind of streamline in, in this whole thing. Mm. The other thing that we also noticed, if I may add that this is more from the scientific output perspective, is that there was a lot of pressure during this, this period to produce results quite fast. So there was a there was a rush to 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 do studies and to present uh, publications and to you know to 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 share results uh, with the community. And what we have also seen is quite a high number of of, of publications being retracted. So things have been pushed to happen so fast that certain considerations or certain rigorousness of checking the, 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 the evidence that we normally do when we have peer-reviewed uh, research being published uh, wasn't done So, in an effort to publish fast. So I think we also need to balance this uh, in the context of trying, on the one hand, to get research and treatments to the patients fast, but also to make sure that we don't lose in the quality of the data that is being published. Thanks. Thanks a lot for your kind response. So we're going with the last one. It's not a secular question, even though I will make it because it's more understanding from one of the attendees uh, saying that cross-border clinical trials are not possible as long as there is a risk for the coronavirus. And she says that when designing clinical trials, please remember all over Europe there are patients who have no access to new medications. When, pl when planning the trial sites, Northern and Eastern Europe should not be forgotten. And yeah, I would like to ask this question because this has been a conversation within the patient community for quite a while. Uh, and uh, whether you can explain why usually uh, certain countries like Eastern European countries, some Scandinavian countries, are less likely to have a, a bigger number of clinical trials compared to other countries, mainly the five big EU or uh, right now the four big EU plus UK. Uh, what's the reason of, of that certain European countries have more uh, clinical trials running compared to some others in, in certain European areas? Yeah, so I'll try to cover it first because it's definitely multifactorial. So uh, there is a difference in the complexity of the legal uh, framework. So there are countries which are slower and more difficult to open. 
So when um, a, a researcher, uh, specifically the industry, will be under the time pressure, because for them the time is definitely money, they'll go for countries where it's quicker and easier. Uh, the other element is that um, more countries you have, more expensive the trial gets. So if you can get all your patients uh, in a reasonable time frame from three countries, let, let's take Germany, UK, and France, which are the usual suspects in there, uh, that will be sensibly cheaper than if you open 10 European countries. So you will spend more time opening them, opening sites, and this is coming from the heterogeneity of the Europe. So more European legislation will become streamlined and centralized and everything. Uh, th this barrier will disappear little by little. But it will has a, have a limitation because uh, you cannot open in all possible sites. You need somehow to, to limit uh, because otherwise it becomes just uncontrollable. So there is this element, uh, these two elements, I must say. Uh, also the size of the country. And so uh, also this is specifically like small Eastern European countries. Uh, again, it's coming to the potential of recruitment in a short time frame. So uh, more easy it becomes to activate things and more things are streamlined again, it will be easier. And then the RTC also uh, participated to research uh, which was actually asked to be performed by EFPM which is the Association of Pharmaceutical Industries, but it was performed independently by EFGCP, so European Forum for Good Clinical Practice, and one of our PhD students uh, looking on the cross-border clinical trials, so where the patient would travel to the clinical trial. And though we think it's not practical for patients, and of course the clinical trial shall first come to the patient, but you can imagine that for certain types of clinical trials you cannot possibly open it everywhere and so there might be need of traveling and there unfortunately the legal framework is not done for that in terms of the infrastructures logistics and reimbursements uh, it's it's very difficult to make patients travel even to limitrophe countries with no language barrier but th there is research being done and I guess there will be follow-up actions uh, after this research being done and actually in the link to the patient course, you have a small presentation about this work that was done by our PhD student about that. So if you're interested more, please look and, and you can even maybe contact her. Yeah. Great. So uh, thank you very much. And I think that was the, that was the last question. So, so we have run and even passed out of time. So Anastasia and Saskia, I would really like to thank you again First of all, for this very clear and comprehensive presentation, also for, for your, your kindness in responding all these questions and, and your involvement since the since since I contacted you. So thank you, thank you very much. It's been great having having you with us today. And um, just before closing, uh, I would like to <laughs> thank you. I would like to remind you that uh, all, all of our attendees that the content of this webinar has been fully recorded and will be available in our YouTube channel and our website shortly. You will receive an email once this is done. And also, I encourage you to follow us on, on Facebook and Twitter to get the latest updates and activities uh, uh, that we are developing. And also, um, I encourage you to visit the member section in our website, which is www.lungcancereurope.eu, to engage with your national or your local patient group in, in case you haven't done it yet. Being said that, I thank you all for attending. I thank you once again, Anastasia and Saskia, for this webinar. And I wish you to meet you shortly in our next uh, activity. So stay safe and I wish you all a very, a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.